Hi everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Neha Kumar and I'm Sikkai Vice President at Large. And in this role, I lead and manage global community support mechanisms within Sikkai, both monetary and not. So the Sikkai Development Fund, the Gary Marsden Travel Awards, the Voices of Sikkai blog post series, uh, the new holidays and events calendars. And in all of this, I'm supported by the incredible Sikkai Development Fund Committee. The job that pays me is that of faculty at Georgia Tech, where I do research at the intersection of HCI and global development. I've been working and unemployed in the US, but India is home for me, and this is where I am at present as well. Thank you all for being here today um, to engage in discussions that are critical for the future of Sikai. I'm not an accessibility expert, but it also doesn't need an expert to know that as an organization, we have far to go before we might be able to contribute adequately towards accessibility needs, requirements, and aspirations of our growing community. I also realize that some or many of you have engaged in these dialogues before, and it is painful and laborious to do so again and again. Complaint, as Sarah Emmett calls it, is diversity work, and we do it because we care and we feel that we need to. But we also need to and want to find ourselves in environments where our complaints are heard without judgment, without defiance, and channeled towards actionable change so that the same complaints are not voiced again and again. And that is why we're here today with the hope that the things that we discuss in this hour are noted, recorded, reported, and reference for accountability so that they're not repeated again and again. I'm very grateful to Stacey and Soraya, our ACs for Accessibility, who put this session together with a lot of care, and to Kayla and Miriam for um, volunteering large chunks of their time for moderating and for sketch note taking, and also other members of the executive committee, some of whom are here, who care deeply about equity to facilitate these conversations where we can listen and learn to better understand how our present and our future initiatives can serve Sikkai best. We'll be doing six more sessions and I'll share the link to the post. The next one is gonna be on March 31st, which is on reviewing and mentorship within Sikkai. Please do join us. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kale, who's our moderator. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so hi again. I'm Kale Passmore, uh, pronouns he, him, they, them. It's your choice. As Neha mentioned, I'm your moderator for this session. So I wanna situate myself a bit first. I'm an HCI researcher and knowledge worker currently settled on unceded Treaty 6 territory in Canada, um, ancestral and current homeland of the Diné, Lakota, Dakota, Cree, Soto, and many other First Nations peoples and the Métis. Um, for transparency's sake, I have several invisibilities, but they're, I do have the privilege of them being largely invisible. I'm going to have to quickly cover the code of conduct in brief. I'm sorry for running through it so quickly, um, but it's available in full at the link that should be posted in the chat shortly. Um, this is a great moment to introduce yourself in the chat, providing your pronouns, location or institution, um, and whatever else you might like others to know about you. So my role here is to maintain the purpose of this event, which is a collaborative discussion of issues and potential solutions around accessibility and ableism within the SIGCHI context. I'm here to kind of keep us on track and facilitate as equitable and constructive a dialogue as possible. The session will be recorded for the first hour, just to let you know. By attending the round table within this time, your consent is ongoing. Any participation, so questions, comments are also being recorded. And that includes content posted to the chat. We'll turn the recording off after one hour to create space for those with comments who wish to remain off record. Um, and so for those same reasons of privacy and uh, consent, we ask you do not share content from the talk on social media. Um, we'll post this talk in full with um, additional accessibility options afterward. And if posting after the event, Hashtag SIGCHI and hashtag equity talk will be your hashtags of choice. Um, when speaking, we ask that you begin by stating your name, affiliation, and pronouns. Um, and you can add to your add your pronouns to the username by right-clicking where your face might be in Zoom um, and then selecting rename. 
So this is not required, but we do encourage it. If you absolutely must discuss potentially harmful, stressful, or sensitive topics, uh, we ask that you do provide everyone with a content warning. Um, we tried, but we're unable to secure a contract for CART, um, which has been additionally complicated due to COVID-19 and wide-scale demand. We're in the process of obtaining a contract for all subsequent talks, and we have professional captioning um, that will be posted in the video afterward. Regardless, we do apologize because CART is a crucial point of access. Um, and this is something I'd like us to return to when the discussion begins. So we encourage constructive criticism and critique in this space. Our time together serves to highlight the incredibly complicated interactions between individual experiences and systemic policies. These are sources of ongoing frustration and oppression for many, as Neha pointed out already. While that frustration is valid, I'd like to remind everyone here that we're an internationally diverse group of humans. So be patient, show sensitivity to anyone who has the floor, keep aware of how much time and space you take up um, and that others may need a moment of silence between comments to collect themselves before speaking. Be critical, but constructively so. Be kind, be supportive, and keep in the forefront of your mind always that not everyone is here with the same education level or culture when it comes to social issues, social justice, or matters of identity. Not everyone has equal access to such communities or to certain sets of knowledge. There may be times when identifying words or phrases are insensitive or just don't feel right to you. If these issues come up, take each other in good faith as much as possible. Offer um, a quick correction and refocus on the topic at the moment. I'd like you to all to remember that people's lived experiences are not up for debate. Um, and in the event of harassment, discrimination, or additional needs by another attendee or presenter, please directly message the moderator, which is me, or one of the other organizers of this talk. Um, finally, I'd like to encourage those who are students and newer members of SIGCHI to offer what's on your mind. If you're wondering if your ideas, suggestions, or experiences are valuable, they are. You're very much in the right place. Um, most of us are anxious when speaking, myself very much included. And this event alone is proof that we're here together, trying to figure out how to move forward and do better. So with the house in order, let's set into this together by first naming the problem. What would you say is the most pressing accessibility problem we face in SIGCHI today? And right as we began, I'd like to point out the top two comments in Slido, and then we'll turn it over to everyone else and sort of jump between. Um, so the top rated comment here is, when it came to equity talks, don't you love it when we prioritize accessibility with resources? Money doesn't fix inaudible captions alone. People who care do. Um, and another anonymous source offered, I'm a deaf slash blind student. Please ask someone who cares to check the captions. What is ATI? Who are inaudible? <clears throat> so if anyone has any sort of comments, shares frustrations like those that have been brought up um, or even can explain some of the complexities behind uh, captioning, cart contracts, anything like that. I think that would be a great place to start. Okay. Sorry, this is Jen Mankoff. Um, she like, heard thanks, Jen. Um, and I apologize for taking a little while to speak up. I, I was unsure about uh, whether you want the uh, panelists to sort of jump in early and first, and also was struggling with all of the different windows that I am trying to have open so I can see Slido and also the Zoom window. Um, so is, would this be a, uh, would it be helpful for panelists to start us off at this point? Actually, I think you've done a great job right there. Um, this is as a round table. Uh, everyone is sort of invited to comment, discuss, and dialogue. 
kind of on equal ground here. So. Um, so I guess I will just say that um, that to me, um, the two biggest issues and concerns that I have are education and representation. And I know that that's going a little bit meta, but um, if we are able to start um, spreading knowledge about how to do accessibility and making sure that um, all of the leadership teams that are running the many different conferences and events that SIGCHI engages with have the knowledge uh, about how important accessibility is to us and how to accomplish it, I think that we will see change because I do believe that people care. Um, secondly, uh, representation is really critical to making that kind of education happen and to ensuring that we can uh, create policy where it is needed. And so while I am very grateful that the EC has added temporary accessibility positions, I think that it is really important to make those um, uh, a permanent presence on the EC by shifting them into a, a, a role that must be filled and kept over time. So those are the two things that I would say are most critical. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, representation, education, and I, I like that you've tied in sort of like who is embodied at SIGCHI changing and leadership change there. Because I, I think that's also like a misconception that I've seen, come, we've come across a couple of times. Um, SIGCHI is not this monolithic unified body it is a group of people who often disagree with one another as well and sort of are pushing for change. Um, but yeah, I'm already starting to take up way too much space. So if someone else wants to pick up. Uh, so I, if I can go, I'm Elaine Short, uh, pronoun she, her. I'm from Tufts University. Um, I think my, let's say, I completely agree with Jen, um, but I think if my pet peeve, let's say, I don't know if I would claim that this is the biggest problem, um, but is that I think in a lot of ways we still exist as a community and a mentality where people with disabilities are acted upon by the community, but not members of the community. Um, when, of course, actually, there are very, very many uh, disabled people in the SIGCHI community. And so um, authors don't think when they're writing their papers that they might be speaking to a disabled, like a disabled reviewer might be reviewing their paper, or that, um, you know, when we talk about trying to improve the representation of students with disabilities, that there are also faculty with disabilities who, and there's a like a, a mentoring tradition there. And um, so I think, you know, something that I would love to see change is just this like mindset around like that, that it's, it's uh, people with disabilities are part of the us, not a them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, what is it on average, even with underreporting overly restrictive diagnostic criteria and a lot of neurotypes that go unrecognized. It's like over 12% minimum of the population and with any HCI that's even higher. Like this is very much an us thing. Um, I love that point, Elaine. And um, I would also add, if I may, and I, I please stop me if others want to speak. I don't mean to take up too much space. But um, I think that uh, making it safe for all of us to be present as people with disabilities in CHI is also important because there are um, very few, for example, BIPOC people who are part of the movement to make um, accessibility present. And I, I believe that is partly about the safety of being part of that, as well as the burdens that people have. And I don't mean to speak for my, my uh, peers who, who are in that situation, but I just think that um, more representation and more safety in, in being able to represent oneself as disabled are important. And I'm probably, I see a question about what is BIPOC, and I'm, I'm not sure that I have the best 
language here, but um, people who are minoritized or come from groups that are, are traditionally excluded are, are sort of what I'm trying to capture there. So please feel free to correct my language. Okay, so for those of you who've just joined, we're on the first sort of guiding question of what would you say is the most pressing accessibility problem we face in SIGCHI today? Um, questions around representation, education, um, leadership change have all come up. If there's anything you'd like to add, we'll spend a little bit more time on this one. Hi, so uh, this is Sherry Truin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I wanted to add, um, I think that we still have too many inaccessible tools and processes that people are expected to use to participate in the community. Um, this is Cynthia Bennett. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a disabled member of SIGCHI. And I would echo basically everything I've heard from Jen, Elaine, and Sherry, and just addressing the accessibility in our whole pipeline um, from submission to review to publication to participation in conferences and events. Um, thinking about accessibility, a biggest problem is I think we think about it piecemeal, um, but really transforming that to thinking about the entire pipeline and actually like acting upon those thoughts and mindsets, I think is the biggest challenge. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, Christian, you had something that you wanted to add? Yes. I am Christian, um, mm -hmm. speaking from the deaf and hard of hearing perspective. I also would like to add the language accessibility it being blocked as well as a barrier. For example, for deaf and hard of hearing people, if you use sign language, you know, we don't offer American Sign Language interpreters all the time for everything. And so then people who don't know American Sign Language as well. So they are speaking in English, and the English world expects everybody to speak in English in general for conferences, correct? But then ASL is not in a comparison to English at all. So internationally, there is support as well for ASL and then also universal sign language, which is completely different. So, or international sign language. So what that means is that conferences, we need to figure out how to have two of them, really the bare minimum would be two sign languages at the same time to have both languages available for the audience in sign language alone. I see Kata has their hand up. Oh, just in this one. Hi, my name is Kata Spiel. My pronouns are they, them. I'm from Tio Wien, and my sign name is this. Um, so um, I was just pondering, uh, like I would just wanted to point out as well that ASL, an international sign, is a very US-centric perspective. I'm currently studying Austrian Sign Language, which is, which is actually another type of ASL, so to speak. <laughs> um, and, but it's very different. Um, and, and I just wanna point out that we might also consider reaching out uh, to, to like the localities that we're in and not just the ones that are represented dominantly in our community. Ramsey, you had something you wish to add? Hi, thanks. My name is Ramsey Meeklum. Pronouns are he, him, um, from the University of Strathclyde. Quite honestly, I have no idea how much context I can, well, how much I can contribute to this context. It seems quite over my head. And I think that takes me to a point of, as an autistic individual, 
I feel like I float between the great area of neurotypical, mainstream, whatever terminology you want to use, and someone who would really benefit from accessibility measures. And sometimes when you're approached with the form that says, do you have a disability or um, additional needs, or however you phrase it, there's sometimes a little bit of, do I really need the support, but I'm, but I, I'm also entitled to it. And I feel like everyone makes such a, f it's good to have accessibility in place, additional measures. Um, you take time and thought to make things easier for certain groups. But then really these are all things that we can do for everyone, which should make it easier for all. Um, so like this is a great example, a wheelchair ramp outside a, an office building is great for the wheelchair user, but you'll find that everyone can use that ramp just as efficiently. It might even be easier than the stairs for some people. Um, so I've just, I just to summarize that, it's trying to support people who feel they may be in the gray area between needing help and also being independent enough or, or they can manage on their own. If that makes any sense at all, please question me on it. <laughs> Does Ramsey. Um, Jen, you also had something you wanted to maybe add on to that? Yeah, I did. I, I love that comment. Thank you, Ramsey. Um, and I think that one of the things that I would love to see in the future that builds on that is a standard for the basics that we just make part of every conference that we hold or every, P, uh, every time we do reviewing or things like that. Imagine if the plenary always had captioning and sign language interpretation at our conferences. And um, there were ramps to every stage. And we always had an accessibility chair, which is not even yet something that is consistently present in every conference. And I'm sure we could make a list of other such things that with it, uh, a small shift in budget and planning would make an enormous difference. And not just for um, uh, those of us who are disabled, but also because captioning helps our colleagues for whom English is a second language and recording helps those of us who have children and can't attend every conference and so many other things like that. So I would, that's I guess another wonderful thing that I would love to look forward to if we move beyond what do we need most to what can we imagine in the future we could do best. Agreed, um, <laughs> completely. I have a comment offered by Manohar. Hi, um, I had difficulty raising my hand on Zoom. Um, so relating to accessibility, um, my thought is that there's a huge community of practitioners in the Global South working with people with disabilities and using technology, but most of them probably are not even aware that a Kai community exists that we are here today. Um, we need to reach out to find ways of reaching out to those uh, practitioners and researchers who are invisible to us in this community. And the positive thing is that this year's Kai workshop uh, offered such a possibility. So we have a workshop that looks at uh, HCI in low resource communities. And a workshop setting allows for a lot more people to participate without the stringent metrics needed to publish in Kai. Unfortunately, a Kai publication has become such a currency for promotions and you know, career advancement that it shuts out people who are doing work for other reasons, but whose work is extremely valuable to us in this community. So that's my thought on broader inclusion of getting people to participate itself or being aware of this community in the first place. Thank you. Just before we continue, I'd like to sort of catch up with the comments that we're seeing. Um, Christian has said plus one CATA, local sign languages where a conference takes place are also important. Um, Molly has said, are high quality captions a good solution in addition to sign language? Um, I've also heard the ideal is two interpreters, one a deaf interpreter, one a hearing interpreter. So really it would be four total questions. Um, Elaine has commented, plus one to the earlier point about identifying as disabled or not, the eternal struggle of, I am disabled enough to ask for accommodations and the related, 
is it worth the effort of negotiating accommodations? Ramsey's added, I agree with Christian, as I saw the potential issues in this session as the screen interpreting sign froze a couple of times, and this is obviously a huge problem if you depend on that individual access to the discussion. Um, next, I see Sarah has a comment. Yes, thank you, Kale. And I'd like to thank Jen very much for raising issues around representation and Ramsey for your um, amazing uh, example of the ramp being accessible to both people uh, who are on wheelchairs, but also who can walk. This is actually an amazing analogy to many different things that we face um, in accessibility, not just physical accessibility, but also other kinds of, of cultural accessibility and barriers that people may face um, and would account to a lot of the representation, the lack of representation that we experience in CHI and other say, CHI conferences. Um, so for example, um, uh, I've been so happy with CHI enabling this year um, special um, reduced registration fees for people from uh, some parts of the world. Uh, I personally know a lot of uh, students who have amazing work and wanted to be part of the community and wanted to show and, and network and um, attend CHI and other CHI conferences, but weren't able to do so before. Uh, this year, I've encouraged them to do so. And because they um, suffer lack of funding um, at all, so they have to self-fund themselves. So reducing uh, the registration fees is not just something that is nice or good, it's actually something that is crucial and helped bring um, a lot of people that wouldn't have been otherwise able to attend at all. Um, another thing, however, that I was uh, very sad about was a lot of Sikai um, conferences that happen once a year uh, get planned around cultural holidays that are observed by a high percentage of people around the world, which is, which is astonishing when we say we want to be inclusive, Kai wants to be more inclusive, and we want more representation from people from, from Africa, for example, and South America, and um, some parts of Asia, and so on. Um, when we plan Kai, for example, around Eid, which is like equivalent to Christmas for Muslims, then we're shutting out a quarter of the world population. We're, we're shutting out half of Africa, basically. They cannot, they cannot attend Kai in Eid. How possibly are we thinking we can do that and, 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 and then still claim we want to be inclusive? Um, so I guess being inclusive and, and planning for accessibility, including cultural accessibility, um, which not only religious people practice, but also people who were born into this culture and, and find this as their family holiday, they get torn and they cannot attend Kai or Sikai conferences. Um, I remember personally attending this in, in Ramadan before, and it was horrible. My girls hated me, um, and I had to break my fasting, and it was tremendously stressful. Um, anyway, uh, what I want to say is that 101 for inclusivity and accessibility and diversity is possibly not, also, not only um, enabling um, things that can help with physical accessibility, but also stressing on a multi-faith calendar being put in mind when planning for Sikai venues, because we want more representation. So we want to bring um, everybody and not have cultural barriers for them. Thank you so much. And sorry for talking a lot. Oh, that was so good, Sarah. Thank you. Um, Neha has one thing to bring up and then I saw a hand from Michael and then Cynthia after Michael. Uh, 
I'm just going to share a link to a blog post that we just showed up about exactly what you mentioned, Sarah. So the point about the, the calendar. Um, we have been actually trying to uh, put together and test a calendar that would uh, community source events from different cultures, different geographies. And we've tested it a bit. We need to test it some more. But basically, the idea is exactly what you mentioned, actually, which is to try to um, have a resource that, that conference uh, steering committees or conference chairs can refer to um, for two to three years in advance just to see what kinds of holidays there are. And if they are going to be um, uh, overlapping with those, then to make uh, adjustments accordingly. So I'll just share the link so that you can read about it. Thank you so much, Nia. Michael? Thanks. These are just two footnotes on what Sarah said, and I agree entirely. Um, footnote one, um, some of us fall on hard times and wind up at, at universities, colleges that don't support our travel or are putting together a year or two of career in adjunct. And so we're not only benefiting students by having um, lower fees and, and fewer travel requirements, we're also benefiting um, early career people past the student point. Second footnote, um, wow, do I ever agree about Eid and, and the exclusion of, of the quarter of the world's population? Please also consider that Orthodox Jews cannot work on Saturdays. And so if we have our workshops on Saturdays, then they can't attend. And um, I actually lost somebody from, from, from being on the conference committee of a two-day conference because he said, if you're holding a conference that I can only attend 50% of, no thank you, I'm not gonna do that. And so, so these are very real issues. And, and Sarah, thank you for everything that you said. Thank you, Michael. I totally agree on Saturday as well. Um, I just had a, a long Twitter thread uh, about this and another colleague also raised issues about um, Kai submission deadline usually being around uh, Jewish holiday. Um, and I totally want to push for this. I want to fight for a multi-faith calendar to be put in place. We are human, as we said in the beginning of this scale. We all come from different backgrounds and from different cultures, which we cannot um, identify ourselves without. And we need to put this in place immediately no more Kais around um, around major holidays, please. We need to be accessible to all and we need to break this, these barriers. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so we have Cynthia and then Elizabeth next. And then I'd like to take a moment to just sort of catch us all up on the comments. Hi, um, this is Cynthia. Um, thanks for calling on me. I'm just echoing what Sarah has said. Um, one concern I have that I think is actually quite large um, is when I talk to people about like accessibility improvements, I think unintentionally we start to think of trade-offs, like maybe we're all designers, I don't know. Um, and I'd like us to really think about not just like, oh, well this year will you know, appeal to people who have concerns about participation because of their religion. And this year will, you know, do better geographically by having Kai in a different continent that we don't usually have it on. I actually, we have to be thinking about all these things together because all of these, you know, disability rights are human rights and so are, you know, our rights to practice our religion and other, other things. And I am just, it's a bit, it's quite frustrating when um, accessibility and like religious observances and like racial justice are kind of pitted as like we can take turns like no we actually need to be thinking of things together so i'm happy that folks have brought up access in terms of um, other maybe disability adjacent um, concerns and i'd like to see that um, kind of responded to by leadership in the way we actually consider all of these things as basic human rights and we can be creative and figure out how to work with all of them thank you Cynthia, it's almost like our liberation is tied together or something. Um, Lisbeth? Hi, good morning, everybody. Well, here in this part of the world, 
this morning. <laughs> My name is Lisbeth Escobedo from CETIS Universidad in Mexico and pronouns she, her. Um, I would like to go back to the line of thought of, of um, Jen. And I think before thinking and going to seek Kai conference like Kai, um, I think seek Kai need to work more in education, probably um, in an HEI curricula, universal for all. Um, also share successfully education models to achieve inclusive education and replicate them, create case studies. Because for example, in, in Mexico, where I am, um, there are no education models to include people with disabilities. So it is difficult to find professionals with disability. So they basically are not in schools. Um, include accessibility in university accreditation or certifications hmm. to educate universities in being accessible to people with disabilities. I'm referring to students, students with disabilities, of course. Um, perhaps CICAI could create a kind of certification on accessibility, perhaps. Um, some other things that we have uh, learned in this time of COVID pandemic time, <laughs> asynchronous classes, conferences for cognitive disabled students. This practice nowadays is, is really helping the students with disabilities, at least in my experience and with some of, of my other colleagues. I think we can keep that practice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, DJ had a comment. Yeah, so thanks very much. Um, I just like to add, this is DJ from University of Washington. My pronouns are he and him. And I am a hard of hearing. I am a person with disability. And I am from India, and I'm a person of color. And so, you know, I have multiple marginalized identities. Um, so, you know, I just, there was a comment by someone about, like, making, you know, Kai more accessible to people for whom English is a second language. And I'd just like to add more on that. So there was an anonymous comment on Slido about proofreading or shepherding papers, um, you know, written by people who have English as a second language. And so regarding that, I'd like to really bring out that ASUS, which is like the premier conference for computing accessibility, uh, ASUTS, ASUS has a mentoring program where you know, senior graduate students provide help to the first time submitters. So I think I benefit a lot from that because the first time I actually submitted a paper to any SCI conference was when I was an undergrad in India. And I didn't know, you know, like how to write SCI papers because there was no one who were offering SCI related feedback in my school. And I didn't know like how to ask for accommodation or, you know, like uh, getting more people to involve in accessibility and stuff. And so, you know, on that, I would benefit a lot from like one of the senior graduate students, Tristan Tonohara, who is a professor at RIT now. And so the graduate student done to provide a lot of feedback on my paper. And I would, it would have tougher to ask it because of that. So I think that the mentorship thing was really cool and really good for uh, people who might be coming into a related conference for the first time. And I was hoping that Chicago can also do something like that. Okay. Um, Andre, before you comment, I just want to catch us up. Um, we have Christian responding to a comment from what seems like ages ago saying deaf interpreters, they're especially valuable for two scenarios. One, people who feel more comfortable with a sign language than the corresponding spoken slash written language. And two, even for people who feel equally comfortable with the corresponding written language, they can still reduce cognitive load. It's complex, but in a nutshell, hearing interpreters are still influenced by the spoken language construct. Um, Andre has added in the comments, getting around in large conferences such as CHI can be a challenge in itself. I had reports from a blind student who attended a conference that finding his way around the conference schedule using a screen reader was a big difficulty. Um, 
Julie has offered that as papers chair for CHI 2022, I've used Neha's multi-faith calendar to set the dates. There will not be conflicts with submission slash review and religious holidays. Um, Vinoba has added the calendar now exists and the hope is that our conference organizers will use it as a resource when we set dates. Jen plus one Cynthia have been told that we can only afford accessibility if we reduce scholarships for African students before. Such a wrong way to frame things. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Ramsey has added plus one and agree with Jen. It's often phrased as though someone else needs to be stepped over to raise someone else up. Um, yeah, it's not a zero sum sort of thing. And Nick has added an ongoing discussion from the start of Africa in 2016 is how written media excludes a wide range of knowledge practices, the detriment of the discipline. While our discipline does embrace various modes of communication, we still promote a deficit approach to people whose literacies are not written ones. I suspect we have an opportunity in HCI, perhaps more than any discipline, to liberate academic paradigms that constrain how knowledge can be expressed. Um, in Slido, Kaylee has added the question, does a retainer model exist in the sign language interpretation industry to stop last minute scrambling or compromises to engage with providers we know we need? Um, if someone would like to actually respond to that, Actually, I could. So Soraya and I have been working really hard to make this possible. When we joined the uh, as accessibility or adjunct chairs of accessibility in, I guess it was October of last year, um, there were already automatic captioning services in place for our videos, but there was no um, contract or uh, even practice of obtaining sign language interpreting. Um, services. And so we're really proud to have worked with uh, an American company just for American Sign Language. We, that's a start <laughs> um, to have a, con a, a contract that we've agreed upon for a like, series of events. So we can say, we'd like to have ASL at these eight equity talks, but we are currently working on a longer term one-year contract where we can say, hey, just bill us. <laughs> We're going to have lots of events between now and next year at this time. So we have a kind of ongoing agreement. Um, and we're trying to do the same thing with CART. And Soraya actually did a lot of the legwork to try to get CART for this event. Unfortunately, we got the signed contract this morning <laughs> and the CART providers didn't show up. But um, we're supposed to have CART services for the rest of the equity talks. And we hope to have I mean, the goal is to institutionalize this, to make it really easy to, um, to uh, invoke when we need these, and also to start to do what Jim was talking about, like have a standard that, you know, every, say we can start with EC. Every EC event has to have, at minimum, <laughs> ASL and uh, live cart, right? Um, and then we should work our way to the conferences as well. That makes me so happy. <laughs> it's just like having uh, worked on arranging to get interpretation a couple of times now, it, it always feels like a huge scramble, even though it's not a surprise. Like we always know that we're gonna need it, but then people are booked so far in advance and um, it, there's a certain level of comfortability with the content as well um and it it's been a huge learning curve so i really feel for you know, accessibility chairs at individual conferences then learning all these little bits that go into negotiating contracts with asl providers and like how much work just that piece is so i really appreciate you um looking into this and smoothing out that process um, and also bringing some consistency to all the other conferences. Thank you, Kaylee. With about 15 minutes left of recorded time, uh, keeping in mind we can continue a little bit after this. Um, Andre and then Christian and then Ramsey have comments. Um, hello everyone, so I'm Andre Freire from the Federal University of Lavras in Brazil. I pronounce he, him. Um, 
I'd like to make some make one comment following uh, what Lisbeth uh, commented to us about the situation in developing countries, which also touches on some of what we discussed in the previous equity talk. And uh, it's also part of our question here. Um, I, I work in Brazil. Um, I've also previously worked um, during my PhD in the UK. And um, I can see a lot of differences in terms of what Lisbeth said of educational policies and the situation that people with disabilities stand in developing countries and in other more developed countries. So in Brazil, for example, we are working at the moment to enhance some inclusion policies in universities, um, both in undergraduate and graduate degrees. So uh, in many situations, having a person uh, with disability working with research and getting to go to a conference uh, it's something that will come after a, a huge effort from the person and from a background that is much more disadvantaged than in many other parts of the world. So it's still not very common and people will have barriers in terms of the technology they've had access to. Uh, I can say that in terms of say people with visual disabilities. Uh, before NVDA in Brazil, for example, we had very, um, a very, I would say very, well, let's say limited screen readers, uh, considering that people would not be able to afford JAWS. And um, you see, may, few people, in, few blind people in Brazil know to ha navigate using headings because the screen readers they had access to when they were educated uh, did not have this feature. Um, so that's an important point in terms of thinking globally. And another thing that I'm, I think I'm kind of touching to the next question, I was trying to save this for the next step. Um, I had a quick look at um, incorporation conferences that see CHI supports. And I think as we also talked in the previous equity talk about how these national and regional conferences can play a role in terms of including people. And I think in many cases, um, say students who had unfortunately a very poor education would not be able to attend a conference uh, in which the official language is English. So many of those incorporation conferences would be the first place in which many people with disabilities will have the opportunity to join an academic community. And uh, I had a look at the previous uh, incorporation conferences and I'm currently in the on the committee for the Brazilian ATI conference this year and talking to some of our colleagues, some of them are here and we've never had an accessibility chair, and we are trying to do that. And I had a look at some other conference, conferences, uh, the German HCI conference, the French HCI conference, the Italian HCI conference, uh, the Indian HCI conference. Um, it's, all, it's all the same. None uh, couldn't find uh, the role of accessibility chair in any of them. I know that this is part of the recommendation for incorporation conferences on the website. But one suggestion I would say it would be important to follow is to work closer with those conferences. Um, even though CHI has had a lot of challenges, and I do acknowledge that, but if you compare to the situation in many other countries, uh, they're much behind. So I think sharing those practices, working close, more closely with those conferences would be a big addition. Thank you, Andre. Um... Yes, Christian, you've been waiting very patiently for a while. Hello, I'm Christian Bogart. I'm from Gallaudet University, and I am he or his are my pronouns. So I'm speaking through the sign language interpreter now, and that's the reason that you're hearing a woman's voice. So I want to go back to the point about the sign language interpreters and the question related to them. Can you receive a retainer? And the answer, no, you can't. Um, you can set up a contract with them, absolutely. And there's a lot of paperwork, it reduces the paperwork actually, and it makes the uh, process a lot smoother. And then if you're looking for an interpreter at the last minute, then that's always a challenge. And the reason is really simple. There's not enough sign language interpreters in the world. So there's just like there's not enough captionists in the world as well. So the requirement is you have to plan far in advance for any event. And that process is 
you know, can be awkward and not knowing what to do. So I strongly suggest what you do is get involved the people with disabilities in on the accessibility committees. All of us are aware of how to handle it. And we've all had experiences with our own disabilities. So we also, I wanted to say with Chai as well, um, has noticed a struggle with the accessibilities being set up. With SIG access, SIG access. We have a lot of experience here. We have a great accessibility committee. And at a recent conference, we were asked about the accessibility committee in relation to this year's conference for accessibility and the feedback of the information. And I'm sure that all of us on the committee uh, will be asked from this year. We're happy to share. If don't feel that you're stuck and you don't know what to do, go ahead and contact somebody on the committee. We're very happy to help you and figure out where the resources are for you for any information. Excellent, thank you. Um, with about the last five minutes, uh, we have Ramsey and then Chen. Thanks, Dean. I'm Ramsey um, from the University of Strathclyde. Pronouns he, him. Um, I wanted to go back to that discussion about being able to get the captions and the same language interpreters, and again, really positive, good stuff. And if anything, it's also beneficial for people who don't necessarily use those services or require those. So obviously, as someone who doesn't use sign language, it's also a surprise when someone starts to use it. But really, that shouldn't be the case. It should be something that's every day. I should be familiar with it. Um, and it's the the I guess it's a taste of familiar familiar the, the, the words <laughs> familiar familiarity with these additional services and even just equipment like screen readers and same language interpreters just things you normally things that we don't things that some people might not interpret as normal you know they become normal the more you interact with them um like I've worked with children that some of them use sign and it's always a learning curve at first of trying to get used to trying to get used to that person's signs and remembering they use signs they don't speak but um it's good to see that this is hopefully becoming something that like you said you just you just ask someone for the bill after the end of lots of meetings it's not a specific person needs a specific service it's something that's present in all meetings and conferences and it's just normal to see it because it is normal but someone's normal, so if that makes any sense. It does. Jen? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to say that I'm here partly um, as a person with a disability and a member of SIGCHI, but I also am here as a representative of a community that if people don't know about it, is actively doing a lot of the kind of work that we've been talking about today. So I am um, the current lead of Access SIGCHI and we collaborate with uh, Sherry Truant and SIG Access and the EC to try to create the knowledge base and also the uh, volunteering base to make it possible to, to serve SIGCHI's needs. Um, we are an inclusive community. I welcome anyone to join us who wants to. In addition to Access SIGCHI, we also run an educational series on a quarterly basis for any accessibility chairs from conferences or anyone else on those organizing committees who wants to know about how they might approach accessibility in their work. And we also serve as a resource for anyone who is dealing with a concern and needs help in advocacy within SIGCHI. So I just wanted to sort of end by making sure that people know that we exist and that we're here to help. And, um, and we have a really wonderful caring group of people on the team um, who are all volunteering their time to try to not only make SIGCHI more accessible, but to help advocate for the resources that will take some of the burden off volunteers eventually. Thank you so much, Jen. Access SIGCHI has been amazing in my experience. <laughs> um, absolutely please go check them out there's so much work and knowledge collected there and so much labor um 
Christian, do you mind if I use five minutes to wrap up the recorded portion and then continue, we can continue talking after that? Yes, that's fine. Um, Perfect. Christian speaking, just to let you know that the interpreter will not be available anymore after the hour, but we can continue chatting as well. Great. So um, while we close things out here, um, I'd like to remind everyone um, of our next talk, which is March 31st, 9.30 p.m. GMT. It's on reviewing and mentorship. There's a link posted in the chat. Um, and let's see here. Yeah, there have been a lot of comments in Slido uh, that we haven't been able to cover. There's never enough time or space. Um, we are continuing this with the video that will be posted um, on. We'll have that Discord server. And we do want to keep this one of many discussions to sort of keep going. Um, yeah. We will stop the recording in about four minutes. Before that happens, I just wanted to say um, thank you to all of the organizers, to every single attendee, um, and to every single person who has put labor in fighting for what is essentially a human right. Um, these are complicated problems and also simple problems. And that's part of what I think makes it so frustrating at times. Um, everyone here has done an, like an exceptional job showing how like ability, geography, class, um, culture, these are all interwoven, that accessibility solutions benefit every single person. COVID has demonstrated this time and time again. And there is a system of sort of like knowledge base, setting policy, making sure adherence to policy happens, and then standardization. Um, that's sort of what I'm hearing again and again as a recurring theme or series of steps. So with that said, Christian. This is Christian speaking. I forgot to take my hand down. I'm so sorry. That's it. Perfect. Um, okay. So while we move into this next unrecorded session, um, is there anything that has been brought up that anyone else would like to touch on before maybe we consider the next topic or offshoot here? Well, can I just interject? We are not going to have an unofficial unrecorded session here on Zoom. Instead, we're going to ask folks to move to Discord because we ah. don't want a situation where there's no sign language interpreter available. Sorry, I miscommunicated that. But. No, no, listen to Stacy. don't listen to me. <laughs> uh, so we, um, and I just wanted to point out, I've heard that Discord has accessibility challenges and I am really excited to learn about what those are and to think through with this community, what our best um, asynchronous communication modes are. Um, so please, please help. And Vino, is there anything that you'd like to add to close us out here? Um, well, I'm Vinoba. Uh, I'm the AC for Equity for Sekai, and uh, I'm based in London. Thank you all for coming and sharing your concerns and your thoughts with us. Um, as Kale said, we have another session coming up uh, on the 31st of March at 9.30 GMT on reviewing and mentorship. Please do join us there as well. Um, but no, I think I'm I'm happy to move to Discord, uh, as Stacy said. Uh, if you want to share that, Stacy, one more time in the chat, so people can then click and go off. But this has been very eye-opening and very useful um, overall. I think. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you all for attending and um, yeah, putting in all this labor. I. I can't promise it'll go anywhere, but I do hope that it does. <laughs>